I'm Miguel. I'm a machine learning researcher, like Martina just introduced, and I'm in the part in the team in Barcelona. Dan and Jason are in the Cambridge UK team, so just so that you get a bit of flavor of where we come from. And today we've been asked to introduce to you to the wonderful world of self-supervised learning. Now, this is a topic that we pretty much research and do research every day, so it's something that we are very excited to introduce to you. And over the next hour, what we plan to do, we have a pretty ambitious plan, is to teach you what is self-supervised learning and when should you use it. We're going to also go in fairly large detail about how modern methods such as Simplier, SimsIAM, BERT, and CLIP work. And then, because we cannot possibly cover everything that there is to cover about self-supervised learning, we're going to leave you with uh, watching a YouTube list of recommendations and a reading list of papers, so that if you want to really start pulling the threads, you, you are able to do that. Right. Um, one caveat before we get started, we're going to be using SSL to mean self-supervised learning for the duration of the talk. We'll use it interchangeably. Don't confuse it with the secure sockets layer of HTTP. Nothing to do with it. Um, right. And then let's see. So we have divided our talk into four sections. The first one is a motivation. So we're going to spend a bit of time saying, studying why is it that you would want to do something like self-supervised learning. Then I'll explain what self-supervised learning actually is. And then Dan is going to walk us through some of the techniques. And Jason will continue with some of the current techniques. And also a sneak peek, a sneak peek into what we think the future of SSL holds. Throughout the presentation, please ask us questions. As I said, some of the material is detailed, and we've done our best to make it digestible. You, you know, we already knew the stuff, so you are the wise ones learning. So, you know, just to stop us, uh, raise, uh, raise your hand. We'll be more than happy to clarify any of the points during the slides. Right? Okay, those are all the disclaimers. Let's get started. Our motivation is going to boil down to Rely, you should rely on computation rather than domain knowledge. And I know this can be a bit controversial, but let's, 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 think, uh, let's expand on this. This is not our idea. This idea comes from Richard Sutton, who is one of the fathers of reinforcement learning. And he wrote a blog post in 2019 called The Bitter Lesson. You have the link there. Now, I'm going to read the, in, the initial paragraph of, of the blog post because it's very interesting. So it says, the biggest lesson that can be read from 70 years of AI research is that general methods that leverage computation are ultimately the most effective and by a large margin. Now, he goes on to say, we just didn't have time to put it on a space to put it on the slide, that researchers generally have acted as if computation was constant and they had preferred to inject their own domain knowledge. Not all the researchers and not everybody, but that's by and large what the field has done. Instead of realizing, hey, computation has been growing, computational power has been growing exponentially over the last 70 years, why don't we act like tomorrow we're gonna have more computational power? That's the, the core of the argument. Now, it, it is a bit of a heated argument and you can ask us questions about where is the role of domain knowledge, but I think there's a point to hey, we have a lot of computational power, let's try and use it. How do we go about that, right? And this is sort of super abstract. So let's, 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 let's pull on this thread a bit more. Now, really to make use of all the amazing computation that is available to us today, what we need is super large amounts of data, right? We need to, because we need to, the, the computation can now crunch it, we can feed it. So let's go on and get that data. But in a traditional machine learning setting, that has generally meant that we also need large amounts of uh, labeled data. And as anyone who's uh, tried uh, to label any data knows, doing this is very expensive, very time consuming. It's really hard, like intellectually hard, like just defining the categories that you want to label for, it's really complicated and it introduces bias. It really doesn't scale. In other words, labeled data is really hard to come by. In his YouTube talk, uh, is Isa Mishra, uh, NYI, and the talk is called NYU Deep Learning Course, he estimates that there's about one million 
box level annotations. By, by that I mean bounding boxes inside of an image. He estimates further that there's about 14 million uh, image level annotations. So that's just one tag for one of the images. But if you look at the estimation of the images that are available on the internet, that's one trillion or five orders of magnitude larger. That's massively larger than, than the other thing. Uh, we thought about putting a plot there, but it was useless because you know you had two bars at zero and then one bar and didn't tell you anything. So that's, that's the thing, it's like so much more data. And I guess you see where I'm getting at, right? But hold that thought for a second. Now I want to do a, a small, I'm gonna switch off the slides for a second. I wanna do a small experiment. Now I cannot pro, well, I'll do it like this. So you see this pen. You know if I drop it, more or less what path is gonna do, right? Yeah, it just, you, you know it instinctively. You, you have this idea already, you, you've been trained with that. If you're watching on YouTube, or if you're watching now, you can really very quickly tell if the audio and the video is desynchronized. It is super unnatural, right? You can also, if I grab the same pen, and I sort of put it, I rotate it, or I put it under a different light or move it somewhere else, you still know this is the same pen. It's, it hasn't changed, right? There's a lot of information that we know, that we have around the objects around that that we, can, uh, that, that we can use. In a way, what I'm trying to say is that supervisory signals are all around us, whether temporal dynamics, lighting invariance, physics, or multimodal synchronization. And multimodal here means audio, video, like different modalities, right? So far so good? So what we are gonna, uh, what we are really asking is, well, is there a way of generating a learning signal from all this unlabeled data that is out there? And obviously the answer is yes, otherwise we wouldn't be here today. So let's see how. And the how is self-supervised learning. Uh, sorry, before I get to start, we gotta get to started. So far, so good. Anyone wants to debate about the bitter lesson? Okay. So self-supervised learning, the way I like to think about it, the, the way I think is more approachable is as puzzle solving. Now imagine you're solving a jigsaw. Uh, you know, you generally have a couple of heuristics that are gonna help you, or really in semantic knowledge, that are gonna help you feel it way faster than if you just brute force in it, right? You know that the sky is blue and it's generally gonna be on top of your jigsaw. You know that plants and vegetation are green. You know that trees have, you know, brown trunks. You know that edges of the picture are gonna continue on the next piece and then you can look for that piece that has an edge that looks similar. There's so much information that we have when we are solving a jigsaw. And this is really what we're gonna try to do. Uh, we're gonna try to make our neural networks do. So the idea is, let's do a two-step process. First, let's set up a puzzle. Let's try to teach our neural network about this semantic information, the sky is blue, the, the plants are green, that we care about, that is useful to then do, say, image classification or whatever downstream task we are interested in. So we set up a puzzle. We train the network to, to be good at solving the puzzle. And then we take one of the last layers of the network. Dan is gonna talk about more, uh, more about which one and, and why. We take one of those and we throw the rest, of the, 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 the rest of the training apparatus away. And now we have that last layer, which we're gonna call either embedding or representation. We can use that to solve the tasks that we care about. So if we are doing image classification, we can then convert all our images to, to classification and then have some sort of classifier on top. And this may sound like a bit roundabout way of doing image classification, but it turns out that all the state of the art is now doing these sort of approaches. There are clear advantages. We don't need as many labels because you're not wasting labels in learning that the sky is blue. You can learn that from the puzzle. And I think that's the intuition behind these methods. All right. So let's formalize this a tiny bit. Now, instead of puzzles, and the, in the literature, we call them pretext tasks, right? And what SSL really is, is the design of good pretext tasks. And these tasks are designed to encourage emergent behavior. That's what I've been referring to as semantics, shared by the downstream tasks, so that's the tasks that we're really interested in, that we would like to solve. So, and the way it works is, is relatively straightforward. We get some unlabeled data. We feed it to a pretext task processor. That sounds 
really complicated, but we're going to see examples of those. And then we obtain some pretext input and some training signal. And then we have input and training. We just do our normal forward, pro forward pass, backward propagation until we converge. And we have our embedding probably in that, lay in that last layer. Once the desired image and behavior is achieved, once we have trained, we throw all of this away and we just keep this neural network there. And we use it for the task that we are really interested in. Let's see examples of these pretext tasks that have been used in the past, starting with computer vision. The first one is rotation prediction. So imagine that you have an object, my, my trusty pen here, and I rotate it by an angle. You need to know sort of the structure, the morphology of the object, if then I need to ask the network, hey, what's the, the angle that this object has been rotated by? It, similarly, imagine that you have an image and you split it in nine chunks. You keep the center chunk and then you choose one of the other eight at random and you ask the network, hey, tell me where on these eight positions does this chunk come from? The network really needs to understand what things go together and, and what it does. Otherwise, it's impossible to solve this puzzle. Similarly, colorization. You give a black and white image and you ask, the, hey, get me a color image. Now, this also has the advantage, if you think about it, that it's really easy to set up. The only thing that we need to do to get labels for this colorization thing is we have color images, we convert them to black and white, those are the inputs, and then we use the original labels as our, uh, the original images as our labels. That's it, easy, right? Similar with filling the blanks. You just get an image, cut out a hole, ask the network, hey, fill the hole. But we have the original one, so we know what the truth is. Similar with the noising. And for you gamers out there, we have uh, super resolution. We don't scale the image and we ask the network, hey, give me the original resolution. And this works, right? Because you really need to, the network really needs to understand what are the semantics of the picture to solve these tasks. Of course, this is not limited to computer vision. Indeed, we can use it on language, natural language processing with word to back This is similar to the gap. So here we have word embeddings and then we just mask one of them and ask the network, hey, what's the word embedding that we are missing there? You really then need to understand a lot of the, of the language to get it. But if you have video, you have your sequence of frames, you sort of shuffle them and ask the network, hey, does this frame go in there? Is this video in order, right? Or audio and video, this is one of my favorites, right? Like you have some audio track, some video track, and you ask the network, very simple question, really. Do, do these two things go together? Do they match? Now, in order to answer that, you need so much semantic information. You need to know what objects make sound, when do they make sound, how does the sound propagate, how do things interact together. It's a lot of, th of things from, uh, from what it is, as a lot of information from what it is a very simple task. So those are the ideas. Now, we are going to see that the field has sort of moved on from this, and we're going to talk about other PTEX tasks in a second, and is going to introduce them. But I wanted you to have a historical perspective of where this, this came from. And really, that's SSL. So what I'm going to do now is compare it with the other sort of methods of training that we have in machine learning. You're probably familiar with supervised learning. It was introduced this morning, and that's very easy. You have an input. You feed it through a neural network of some sort, obtain a prediction, compare with the label, get an error, and compute the gradients of that error, backpropagate the, the, the weights, blah, 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 you get your trained model. And supervised is similar, except we don't have labels, so then you may have something like, you know, some sort of clustering, and then depending on the quality of the clustering, you get your loss and your gradients, and so, forth, so on and so forth. But self-supervised is different. As I said, it's a two-step process. And the first one is we set up our pretext task, we train, we obtain our representation, and then we can use our representation both for an unsupervised task, like clustering or, or, or looking at you know, that sort of quality, or for a supervised task. It really depends on what our final idea is. Or indeed, I should point out, we may be able to do both this research on trying to have general representations. One last thing I wanted to leave you with is the differences with semi-supervised learning. This is something that may come up if you are reading, uh, if you are reading out there and it may be confusing. So semi-supervised learning is a technique 
to train data when you have some labels, some label data, and some unlabeled data, right? So it's just that, getting, you have some data, some of which is labeled, some of which is unlabeled, how do I make best use of this? An example of a semi-supervised algorithm is a semi-supervised uh, uh, variational autoencoder. Now, an autoencoder learns by encoding, uh, by encoding and decoding itself, and variational means that the, the, the bottleneck that is in between the encoder and the decoder is a probability distribution. The, in the semi-supervised case, so in the semi-supervised VAE, then what we do is when we have a label, we use it, but when we don't, we use the prior from the VAE to produce a label for us. And you see how that works, right? The, the whole idea of semi-supervised is that you synthetically create some labels for the semi-supervised algorithm. Now, I've, I've been wanting to point out that not all VAEs are semi-supervised and not all semi-supervised algorithms are VAEs. So please don't take that idea. The semi-supervised VAE is just an example. Also, another debate, this, this slide has caused a lot of debate in our team. The, another debate that we had is, well, some people were saying, look, if you think about it, if you use self-supervised learning to train a, a representation, and then you use a small portion of label data to train your embedding, isn't that like semi-supervised learning? I mean, you're just using not labeled and non-labeled data. And the answer that we came up with is like, not really, because in semi-supervised learning, there's only one objective and one training procedure, right? You just have different ways of dealing with labeled data and non-labeled data. Whereas self-supervised learning is very much about setting your pretext task and then your downstream task. And there's a two-step process with different optimization procedures and different objectives. Right, that's it for the motivation and the definition. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, sorry, well, I'll, I'll just repeat the question, it's easier. The question is, what is a VAE again? A VAE is a variational autoencoder. It's, an, it's a form of neural networks that gets your input, that works by getting your input, encoding it into some sort of embedding, and then decoding using another neural network and reproducing the exact same output, right? Uh, the variational means that your embedding, instead of just being random sort of uh, vector, it's a distribution that, that you do, and, and that's it. Cool. Then if there's nothing else, I'm gonna hand it over to Dan, who's gonna continue telling us about the current techniques. Great, thanks Miguel. Um, and just to reiterate, uh, if at any point you want to just ask a question, please just do interrupt me uh, and I'll try and clarify as best I can. Right, so if we are doing our job, at this point you have some idea of what self-supervised learning is and what self-supervised learning isn't. And uh, what Miguel alluded to is that compared to the methods he presented, things have moved on a little bit in the last few years. So what I'm going to now present is uh, where things have gotten to um, and basically they come under two main schools of thought. Uh, there is what I would call multi-view invariance. Uh, Lucas also uh, referred to equivariance later, so I'm gonna touch on that a little bit because that's an emerging uh, direction in self-supervised learning. So there's multi-view invariance, uh, in which case we're gonna produce an encoder that under different views, I'll be specific about views in a second, um, two different views of a given input are gonna be represented in an equivalent way that's particularly useful for us. Uh, and there are two kinds of those. Um, there's the contrastive approaches. I'm going to do a deep dive on Simclear, um, but there's also many others, including CLIP, we're going to cover. And there are also the distillation style methods. Um, so these are very popular at the moment, the multi-view invariance. And then the second school of thought is reconstructive. Uh, so we already heard about uh, denoising autoencoders, probably one of the earliest uh, examples from Vincent. Uh, and we're going to deep dive into BERT, uh, one of these methods from natural language processing. So. What is multi-view contrastive learning? There are really three ingredients in this. Um, the first step is to get multiple views of your input. Now, depending on what data you're working with, you might already have them. So in the clip case uh, discussed earlier, we had text image pairs. Now you can think of text and image pairs as actually being two different views of the same underlying 
abstract thing that produced text or images from, from some kind of process. Uh, so in that case, you wouldn't need to create anything else. You can just use the pairing. Or in the, uh, the vision case, um, maybe you only have an image. And so you actually need to do a bit of work yourself to produce multiple views of the images. Uh, and we use an augmentation procedure to do this. So I'm going to deep dive into that. However we got there, we're going to have uh, multiple views of the input. And then we're going to represent those views somehow. Uh, representing just means uh, getting those views and pushing them forward through some neural network. So we're going to create view representations. And then once we've got those view representations, contrastive learning has two components. It's going to have a loss which pushes representations of views of the same input. So the input that produced the multiple views represent those closer together. And then the second component is different views of different inputs. We're going to push those further apart. Now, Jason later on is going to talk about distillation-based methods. And the main distinction between contrastive methods and distillation-based methods is that contrastive methods have this pushing apart of different inputs component, whereas distillation methods do not have this component. Um, one other piece of nomenclature that might come up is that views of the same inputs, they're sometimes referred to as positives for the contrastive learning method, and views of different inputs are sometimes referred to as negatives for the contrastive learning procedure. Right. Next, I want to talk about some of these augmentation procedures in the vision domain. What we have here are four images, and I want you to just look at the top left picture of this, which is a dog. Now, what we're going to do, or what we can see, is that we have two global views of this dog. Uh, the dog is uh, flipped with respect to left and right. Uh, there is some kind of color modification, and it's probably hard to see, but there is also some difference in the level of zooming uh, into this dog. So this is a very, very standard uh, image processing pipeline, um, just a standard set of techniques. And we're going to apply these augmentations and get many, many different views. Sorry, I saw a hand up. Was there a question? No? OK, great. Um, but if there is, uh, do, do please interrupt me. So. We're going to apply what we call an augmentation policy, which is typically a stack of uh, transformations that are applied uh, stochastically to produce different views. Now, the reason these are called global views is because, as you can see, uh, most, uh, most of the information of the original image is actually present in both of the views. There has been some work more recently, so methods like Dino and Suave have introduced something called global and local views. Um, so you can think of this in terms of like a global local correspondence or a global local inframax. And so this is the idea of creating a puzzle where not only am I going to have to recognize when two different instants are the same at the sort of wider scale, but I actually need to understand how different pieces of an image might fit inside uh, a larger image. So in this particular case, you would understand that this particular eye of the dog would actually be associated with pictures of dogs. And you could imagine, for example, if you had a big picture of the sky and there was just a bird somewhere, a tiny bird in the corner, you'd understand now that birds uh, lived in the sky uh, or fly in the sky, uh, if that was the correspondence you were, you were doing. Now I'm going to come back. So if we're going to be producing an invariance criterion, what it means is that these views here are going to be pushed forward through an encoder and made to be the same. I want to go back to the equivariance notion now. So in that case, what I would be doing is I'd be representing these views in a systematically different way. So I'm going to get two distinct representations uh, for the views such that the transformations that cause the difference between the views can actually be recovered from the representations themselves. Um, so to give you a better idea of that, when Miguel was rotating the pencil earlier, um, if, I, if I didn't really care about the absolute orientation of the pencil, then I would want a rotation invariant representation of that pencil. But if the task I eventually cared about was what angle is the pencil at classification task, that would be a terrible thing. Um, so instead, what you could do is produce an image representation that is rotation equivariant. And the result of this would be a representation space that systematically transformed uh, in like a predictable way when the image is oriented uh, in a continuous manner. And from this, it would be very, very easy to determine the angle of orientation on the pencil. Okay, so 
The choice of augmentation is crucial, as we will see later, but now we have all the ingredients we require to actually talk about our prototypical self-supervised learning example, which is SimClear. Now on the right, we have this diagram, SimClear. And the first thing I need to point out is that there are not four models here. These are the same models. There's weight tying across here. So there is one projector and one encoder. I'm going to walk you through the diagram of how SimClear works. So we're going to imagine a case where we have just two images. Let's imagine our batch size is two. And then we're going to take each of these images and apply our augmentation policy, whatever it is, to produce two different image augmentations for each image, resulting in four images in total. Once we have those four images, we're going to push them through the encoder, giving us four representations. And then we have, once we have those four representations, we're going to push them through the projector, producing four projections. With these projections, we're going to do exactly what I introduced as the ingredients of a contrastive learning process. So we're going to, with some loss, attract projections of the same instances, or positives, together, and repel instances uh, across instances or negatives. So we're going to push the red lines apart in representation space or projection space, and we're going to pull the white lines together. And when this objective is solved, then these two views will be represented in an equivalent way because their distance in projection space under some metric will be zero. Does this make sense at a high level to everybody? Yes. Right. So the question was, can I understand how uh, augmentations and views are related? Yeah. It's a great question. Um, so in the case where you have um, something like paired data, so you have image text pairs, right? Or even as Magal was talking about videos, in which case you have sequences of frames and audio. You can treat um, each of these modalities, if you want, as the different views and contrast those. So if you have access to those, that's great. Um, but if I just have images, if I just have an image, I've only got the one view of that image. And so what we're going to do is artificially create what I refer to as views of the image through an augmentation procedure. So the really simplest thing you can think about is just a standard image. Then I would say, okay, well, what would be an equivalent image that I would draw that would be related under the natural distribution of images? It would just be the horizontally flipped version of that image. Um, that, that would be a reasonable thing to do. And so, exactly. Great. Are there any other questions before I continue? I, um, when you project, uh, how do you choose this, this space, uh, the space that you are projecting into? Great. How do you choose the space um, that we project into? Um, the, we'll see um, how, high, how important hyperparameters are later. But the, the basic answer to that question is uh, there's no real the theoretical reason in general why you would choose one space over another. So it really just is uh, empirical. Uh, you just uh, form a validation set and do a hyperparameter optimization. Um, typically, uh, at least in SimClear, um, the space is projected from the encoder, which is typically a ResNet 50, though it works using vision transformers also, more recent. Um, and then the projector would be like a two or three layer MLP, typically into, I think, a 256 dimensional space. But this is an empirical result. Okay, if there are no other questions, I will uh, keep going. Okay. We have oh, a question. Yes, of course. Just a quick question. Uh, the attraction and repel is uh, the energy idea? Yeah. That's a great question. So actually, yeah, you're right. Jan Lukin has a, an energy-based formalism or thinks about this in terms of energy and attraction in the bowl, uh, attraction and repelling. Um, in specifically SimClear, um, the way we're going to do this, and I'm going to go uh, in detail in the next few slides, is to a loss function which is called the temperature normalized cross-entropy loss. Um, so we'll see precisely in SimClear how that works. Thank you. 
Any other questions? Awesome. Okay. So uh, we have concepts negative. All right. So now let's go into temperature normalized cross entropy. So what I'm going to do is convince you, hopefully, uh, that what we're going to be ending up doing is something that looks very, very much like a supervised classification problem in order to achieve the contrastive learning puzzle solution uh, outset. So we're going to be, uh, let's think about this. So we have pairs, and I need to try and decide whether the pairs are or are not related by an augmentation. This is the way to think about this. So we're going to have a classifier or a categorical distribution that is going to be conditioned on pair information. So to produce that conditioning, the authors of Simclear choose uh, cosine similarity. So it's specifically cosine similarity between those projections. So we're going to call the projections uh, Z, and then this is just uh, indexing into the Zs uh, to produce a similarity matrix uh, S. And um, there's something I've hidden slightly under the carpet now. So um, let's imagine that we've drawn a batch size of a uh, number of instances N. Then actually these I and J are going to index from one to two N in the case where we have uh, two augmentations per instance. So just for not notational convenience, uh, Z is going to be indexed across both augmentation sets. And the first N examples will be the first augmentation set. And the second n examples, i.e. Uh, n plus 1 to 2n, uh, will be the second augmentation set where the uh, first rows and the second rows all correspond to each other. Um, so yeah, we're going to have the similar similarity matrix, which is a 2n by 2n matrix. And then we're just going to define a likelihood, uh, a likelihood over non-trivial positive pairings. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, if we go back to the Simclear diagram, I drew an attraction force between uh, views that were related by a transformation. However, it's not necessarily that useful to say that this projection on the left-hand side is the same as itself. That's kind of a trivial statement, right? I am myself. So what we don't want to do is be assigning positive mass to this, but what we do want to be doing is assigning positive probability mass to the white uh, attraction elements in this diagram. So the way we do that is by having a probability distribution that's going to sum to one when we ignore the diagonal components. So that when we uh, evaluate i and j across all pairs apart from the self, uh, we, we, we get a, a true probability distribution. Other than that, this is just the, the softmax function. Uh, this is just a reminder that the indexes are across the stacked augmentation sets. And one other uh, component of temperature normalized cross entropy is the temperature parameter tau. Um, it's very, very useful for convergence. Um, but other than that, I, I don't think it's really key uh, in, in understanding how it works. It's just very, very important in terms of optimization. So we have a likelihood. So what do we do with our loss function? Well, we form a negative log likelihood because we're just going to be doing uh, maximum likelihood estimation. And then uh, this is just a symmetrization. So uh, if I have the element i in the batch, it's going to have the i plus one element being the corresponding positive. And you can ask the question looking the other way around. The i plus one element of the batch has a corresponding positive pair that is the i element. Um, so putting this all together, this is just a maximum likelihood uh, objective. Um, and it really just looks a lot like supervised uh, classification at this point in time. Now, although it just looks like that, there are actually some really cool uh, things behind this as well. So it turns out that by minimizing this uh, objective, you're actually maximizing a lower bound on the mutual information between the two views of the instances. So this objective is also called the info NCE estimator of mutual information. Um, that estimator was introduced in a work uh, called CPC, uh, Contrastive Predictive Coding, where they used this estimator before Simclear uh, to actually represent uh, sequences rather than images. And that work itself um, was heavily inspired by a much older work um, from Goodman and Hivarinen uh, called Noise Contrastive Estimation, uh, where instead of 
uh, building a classifier which was telling whether pairs came from the same source and some transformation or not, um, the, the classifier was actually trying to figure out whether um, some instance came from noise or uh, data. And it turns out that that's very, very useful for optimizing the parameters of non-normalized statistical models, like an energy-based model, but without a partition function. So I just wanted to give you um, some additional historical context of how this objective was uh, arrived at. Um, and we have the references there that I recommend digging in if you want to have sort of a wider theoretical understanding of how this works. But what I hope um, and I've kind of convinced you is that by building this augmentation procedure, we have something that really just looks like uh, supervised learning. Now, I think this is great, but actually what helps me really understand a method is to walk through the pseudocode. Uh, so I'm going to do that now, and hopefully at the end of that, uh, you'll have enough of a picture to maybe even uh, uh, implement Simpler for yourselves. So here it is. What are the ingredients? Well, we have F, which is the encoder. As I said, typically a ResNet 50 in Simpler, although there are also Vision Transformer works. Um, and then we have this projector MLP. Let's just dive down to the NT accent. That is the, that's the normalized uh, temperature cross entropy objective. And the inputs to that are just SIM, that's the 2N by 2N similarity matrix. And then I and J, which are just going to be evaluated for the positive pairs that are determined. Uh, we do the exponentiation transformation that's going to build the conditioning for the softmax. And then we're just going to divide by the uh, normalization quantity or the partition function, skipping the identity term so that the thing is actually a likelihood on non-trivial pairings. Uh, then we return the negative log likelihood in preparation for it to be a loss function. So this is really uh, just a programmatic way of putting uh, what I had on the previous slide. And then let's walk through it. So we have some data loader. We iterate through it so that X is just a batch of N images. With those N images, we apply this org function. Now, this is going to apply the augmentation policy, and I want to uh, stress that this is a stochastic application, so repeated applications of the augmentations will give me different transformed versions of X. So X1 and X2 are distinct with high probability, and then we're going to produce representations by pushing them through the encoder. After we have those representations, R1 and R2, we produce uh, the projections by passing them through this projector MLP. Here's our notational convenience again, so we concatenate Z1 and Z2, build our similarity matrix, and then build the loss elements for each element in the mini batch. Then we just take the expectation and do backpropagation and update with our favorite optimizer. This is the entirety of Simclear. Does anybody have any questions? OK. So I was always about 60% happy with this. But if what I've told you is true, which is that all we're doing is uh, choosing some augmentation policy, and then we're happy because the encoder is going to produce me something that's augmentation invariant, and that augmentation invariance is useful because it's effectively removing information that I know already is not useful for my downstream task that I care about. Why is there a projector? Why isn't there just an encoder? It feels very inelegant to me um, and frustrated me for a long time because otherwise I think everything is very nice. Um, and so actually the reason is that things aren't always that simple and the answer is we don't know what the augmentation procedure should be. Okay, so it turns out that if I take this image, pass it through the encoder and produce some representation, if I pass it through the projection, I do get something that's augmentation invariant. You might have seen plots where if I look at how good a network is at doing supervised learning, layer by layer, you'll see that the deeper you go, um, the, the better performance the network is. There's like a monotonic increase in accuracy the deeper I go um, towards the end uh, classifier uh, simplex. Um, the same is here, except our classification task is augmentation invariance. 
So the deeper and deeper you go into the encoder towards the projection, the more and more augmentation invariant you become. And the observation is that it turns out the augmentation invariance with respect to the image augmentations we have isn't actually what we want for our tasks. Um, so to put it another way, there's actually a misalignment between classical image transformations that we have access to and actual tasks that we care about. And so what we can do is basically realize that the data processing inequality can save us because if I get here, everything is invariant. If I step backwards a bit through the network, things are sort of kind of invariant. There's more information maintained in RI about the input than there is ZI. And it turns out that there is an empirically optimal place uh, to extract representations. Actually, kind of funnily, it, it isn't actually here. It's actually one layer into the projection, but that's like an, another story. Um, but uh, this procedure has now been very, very well empirically established. It's called guillotine regularization. Uh, and it's actually one of my favorite papers uh, from last year that's working into the understanding of why self-supervised learning methods are designed like they are. So for now, what we're going to say is, OK, so the encoder is going to spit out the representation. And then afterwards, we're going to throw this projection away because it turns out this wasn't quite what we wanted. But somehow, RI is very good for our task. Now we have established what representation we use. Um, before going to results, I'm just going to talk about how you might use that representation. There are typically two ways that you can use this. Um, the first one is called frozen encoder. Um, so in this case, we're not going to update any of the parameters of the encoder itself. And you can really just take the representation set as a fixed output. Um, and on top of this, you can train uh, a linear model using the labels of your task be that a linear regression or a logistic regression or an MLP, if you like, or even some kind of k-nearest neighbor or any other method. Um, so that's just what a frozen encoder does. Uh, the other thing you can do is you can realize that actually we have an encoder that can be trained fully further. And so instead of producing representations, the way that the community now thinks about this is self-supervised learning is conditioning the optimization. Uh, and so here, we're going to use the gradients of the labels of your downstream task to optimize the entire encoder rather than just what happens on top of the encoder. These methods have pros and cons. Um, if you have enough data and compute, fine tuning probably will give you better results, but you should check. Um, but also some of the generalization power from the invariance properties of the self-supervised learning method will be lost when you fine tune because you are destroying the encoder. So you should be very careful, for example, with your learning rate schedules. Um, fine tuning is also more time consuming than uh, frozen encoders because there are more gradients to compute. But, and I stress this, um, it does require less uh, time to get a good result than training the entire encoder from scratch because all the uh, sort of um, priors that you want to learn are baked in, there's actually less to learn from scratch. Um, and this uh, Jason will touch on a little bit, but from a practical point of view, if you really do want to uh, boost the performance of your models in quite a cheap way, then what you can do is try to download, and there are, there's like Torch Hub, TensorFlow Hub, and many other places on the internet, um, self-supervised learning methods that can be a starting point for your optimization. And this can really save you a lot of computation and get you some incredible results. Okay, so these are all the other ingredients of SimClear. Now let's see how it performs. Well, its performance is strongly dependent on three factors, the augmentation procedure that you use, the batch size that you use, and how long you train for. Let's look at augmentations first. So this heat map was from the original SimClear paper, and they basically investigated what happens when you apply one transformation type followed by another transformation type to produce the different views um, for most combinations of transformations. And this is an analysis of the linear performance on, image, on ImageNet after a small amount of training. And what you realize is that the best combination, again, this is just empirical, is if you do a crop first, followed by a color modification. So that explains why if you now look at many, many different self-supervised learning models, not just SimClear, but MoCo v3, uh, SimSciam, Dino, uh, the first two stages 
of the augmentation policy are to do a crop, usually a random resize crop, uh, followed by what's known as color jitter and grayscale. The reason is because it works well on ImageNet. And I'm stressing on ImageNet is very important because if you want to take self-supervised learning to quite a different domain, then it would probably be worthwhile looking at something uh, like this for your data set because you know, not all data sets are like ImageNet. And especially if you're looking at something like medical domain, for example, um, you should probably be looking at what kind of transformations you should be using and testing various combinations. So for now, we're just going to proceed with the first transformation being random resize crop and the second being some kind of color transformation. Given that transformation policy, the x-axis here is how long we're training for. The y-axis is linear probe or linear model on a frozen encoder test top one. And the colors are the different batch sizes. There are two key points here. The longer you train for, the better your performance will be. So it's very, very simple to understand how you would make it better. Um, and the second thing is, more or less, uh, the larger your batch size is, uh, the better your performance will be as well. Um, and the basic reason for the batch size actually comes back to the mutual information statement that I made earlier. It turns out that the mutual information between the two views is actually controlled. Well, the tightness of the bound is logarithmically controlled uh, by the size of the batch. So the, uh, the larger the batch size, the tighter your bound on mutual information is. So this is, um, I don't know what's going on there. Uh, so this is uh, simpler. And um, before I pass over to Jason, who's going to be talking about distillation-based methods, uh, does anybody have any questions? Please. Um, so from what I get, it's like right now you only use two augmentations? That's a good question. Uh, no. Um, in this particular heat map on the uh, left, two uh, augmentations, one followed by the other, were ablated and figured out which are the best combinations. Um, but if I recall correctly, the actual SimClear pipeline that they arrived at, Jason, correct me if I'm wrong, I think has four augmentations. There's random resize crop followed by color jitter, grayscale, and solarization, possibly also with Gaussian blur. So it's a total of five, uh, one followed by the other. And, and uh, the number of augmentations affects the performance in like, I mean, I don't know, but uh, like, how does it affect if I decided to do 10 augmentations, for example? Right, okay. So that there are actually two pieces uh, to this. Um, one thing that I neglected to mention, and I'm glad you brought this up, is that in the case where you can pull multiple augmentations, where you're producing actually more than two views, you can produce like K views, for example, um, there's this really cool paper um, which which looked at what happens when you just draw uh, multiple augmentations, but from a fixed augmentation policy, holding the batch size constant or growing the batch size. And what you see is that doing so uh, has a great improvement on the, um, the gradient uh, signal to noise error. So from an optimization perspective, doing lots and lots and lots of views, if you can afford it, is probably a good thing. Um, in terms of doing lots and lots of augmentations, Jason will briefly talk about augmentation strength, but the, the TLDR or the, the sort of short summary would be that if your augmentation policy is too strong, um, I'm, I'm sort of like relating too many augmentations and too strong as being the same thing. If your augmentation policy is too strong, your pretext task is not solvable. And if it's not solvable, like in practice, like if you as a human could not do this, this task, uh, the machine learning model will also not uh, solve the task, and in which case your optimization will fail. Um, yeah, I think this is my summary for the talk. Mm -hmm. Any other questions on Simplia? Mm -hmm. When you were constructing the uh, metric, I saw you, uh, you were using augmentations of the same instance, right? Um, so you're actually only, uh, where are you constructing uh, the repelling part? I only see the, um, the attracting part. Am I missing something here? No, no, that's great, right. So in this case, um, we have X1 and X2. Uh -huh. They are different augmentations and they're being stacked together. And in the NT accent, we're sending uh, i and j through 
uh, where the i and j are related as positives. So that's the attracting part. This is the, the numerator on the softmax. But um, if you look at it in log space, right, if you take the log here, I'm going to have the log term minus the logarithm at the bottom. And so this is actually a repulsion. The, the, the denominator of the likelihood or the softmax is the repulsion force between the negatives in this case. But where are you inputting uh, augmentations or views of different images? Right. Um, so the augmentations of views of different images. Um, so Z contains both augmentations of uh, all images. So Z is this 2N by D uh, matrix. And so the I that's running over the first N is like the first augmentation. And then the I which is running from uh, n plus 1 to 2 n is the second augmentation set. This is just of notational the, convenience. Yeah. I see. Okay. okay. And then this summation on the bottom is across all i equals 1 to, sorry, k equals 1 to 2 n skipping k equals i. So this is a negative on everything that is not equal to yj. Okay. Thank you. And if you allow a second question, the yeah. temperature, is that a hyperparameter or does it make sense to, to uh, let it go down? Like, do you have a schedule for it? Mm, great question. Uh, so Dino does have a temperature scale. Um, CLIP, as you'll see later, takes a different approach. I'll let Jason explain this. Um, but in SimClear, at least in the base, we hold temperature equals 0 0.1 as a constant. It seems to work pretty well. I think I saw one more question. Yeah, I have a question. Um, how would the SimClear architecture change if it was an equivariant um, problem? I think I'm, 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 yeah, I'm not very clear on, like, would I, would I be able to know in a controlled manner what my aug augmentations would look like if it was an equivariant problem? And like, how how do I ensure that I know what the representation would look uh, like? How would it look like? Great, yeah. Um, so as far as I've seen, there's only one instance of a really successful equivariant SSL algorithm. Uh, so it's a, it's a variant of SimSiam, which Jason will present later. Um, but the key difference is instead of pushing um, the projections together, the, the difference you should think of is if I know um, the, the nature of these augmentations, so let's say it's a random resized crop, so I could accompany this image uh, with a tuple that tells me the coordinates into the image that corresponds to the crop. It could tell me where the crop is, or I could have a Boolean flag which tells me whether this uh, image has been vertically flipped or not. So I know the metadata in principle, if I've done it correctly, of the transformation. And so the way that the method becomes equivariant is from two projections, the question is, can I uh, classify what the transformations were that resulted in the difference? Yeah, so um, to put another way, uh, if I just have like a, a rotation, for example, of this image, um, there'll be two different rotation angles. They'll have a relative rotation angle. And so given two representations here, can I predict the rotation angle? Uh, and there's a paper from Facebook called Equiv SSL that does something like this. And uh, yeah, for 90 degree rotations, there is a performance uh, improvement compared to being, to being 90 degree rotational invariant. Okay, well, I'm now going to hand it over to Jason. Uh, he's going to talk about distillation methods and beyond. Thanks, Dan. Cut this mic. All right. Uh, thanks, everyone. Um, so we're now we're going to take a look at another class of models uh, that we broadly wrap around the self-distillation paradigm. Um, so these models that we're going to talk about are still uh, multi-branch objectives, just like Sinclair. Um, however, rather than having negative samples uh, repel each other we're only going to consider positive samples. So we're only going to look at the distillation side of the objective where positive samples need to match each other. Um, and there, in, in this notation, typically, we have uh, a teacher and a student. And the thing that's distilling into the model that we care about is the teacher. And the student is the one that's being uh, updated over time. There's a couple of common techniques or common models uh, that are used. Uh, one is called Bootstrap Your Own Latent, uh, and another one called Dino. Both of these models leverage an exponential moving average of the model itself. So Polyak, way back in the 90s, uh, found that exponential moving averages of model parameters improved performance boundaries by some epsilon margin. Uh, 
And BYOL and Dino uh, use this fact to be able to distill information back into the learning process, which is really quite creative. Um, finally, there's SimSiam, which is the one we're actually going to talk about because it's very simple. Um, and there's no exponential moving average. It's just one model, just like in SimClear that we were talking about earlier. All right. So SimSiam is one of the simplest forms of distillation-based learning. Um, again, we in the single mode case, we take one image, uh, we project it through some augmentation policy, which can be a stack of different augmentations uh, to produce a single view. Uh, we do the same thing again to produce another view, and we pass it through an encoder model. Uh, here the encoder model is the same, just like in SimClear, uh, but like I mentioned in the previous slide, BYOL and Dino use an exponential moving average of the top model here as the teacher. So in this graph, this would be the teacher, and the top model here would be a student. Uh, there's also an extra MLP in the top network that's, uh, that's not part of the bottom network, and that's called the predictor network uh, in the typical papers that you might read. Uh, the reason for the predictor network is to pre prevent a collapse phenomenon, which I'll talk about in a slide in more detail. So if that's not clear, don't worry. A very important detail here, though, is that the bottom network, the teacher, has the stop gradient operator, and that's these two dashed lines. So if you ever see this notation, that means it's stop gradient. So there are no gradients routed through this part of the learning process. It's only going through the top part of the model here. Um, the loss that people typically use here is, again, cosine similarity, uh, but people have used L2 pretty successfully. Uh, and so it's, it's, a very, it's similar to SimClear in that similarity is what's important. Um, and as you can see here, there's no negatives, right? Uh, so there's no repulsion, it's just attraction. Um, and we'll see this a little bit more once we break this down. So just like with the other algorithms, uh, let's look at some pseudocode. Um, so for any sample in some data loader, for example, uh, we will augment it twice. We'll create x1 and x2 by passing it, that single x through the augmentation policy. Uh, this will actually produce two x's that are dissimilar from each other, typically, because the policies are stochastic. So when you sample from this, you might get random resize crop with you know, a very zoomed-in view and one that might not be a zoomed-in view. Obviously, these details are very, very important, like Dan talked about with SimClear, and they need to be ablated if you want to transfer it to some other new task that you've not explored before. Um, we pass these uh, inputs through the backbone models and uh, an MLP projection. And finally, we pass them again through another MLP for the prediction heads. Um, then we compute the loss, which is, again, just a symmetrized loss. So you're going to see uh, two components here. The most important detail, if you're going to take away anything from this, is that in the distance objective, there's this detach. So there's no stop gradient going through the, the model for that's distilling information down. And this is just your negative cosine similarity. Uh, so that's relatively straightforward. Uh, and you just update your model. So you can see this is a relatively straightforward framework, and it works pretty well in practice. Um, there are some empirical trade-offs to make if you use SimSiam versus something like BYOL or Dino, um, and the performance guarantees are slightly different. Uh, so we've been talking about the really cool things uh, about SSL, uh, but something to bear in mind is one of the pitfalls, which is collapse. And there are two types of collapse phenomenon. Uh, there's representation collapse and dimensionality collapse. So representation collapse is essentially when the encoder outputs a constant, whatever the input, um, and you know this satisfies the similarity objective in both cases, typically. Uh, so you can see how this could be problematic. Uh, the second form of collapse is dimensionality collapse, uh, where the embedding vectors typically end up spanning a lower dimensional subspace uh, instead of the entire available embedding space. And um, there's, there's many different, there's no one solution to preventing collapse, essentially, but we'll talk about some of the cases where they do happen, and there are some metrics that can be used to keep track of what's going on as well. Cool. So what causes collapse? Um, and different models go under, diff face different collapse phenomenons. So Dan presented SimClear earlier, uh, which is a contrastive method. Uh, so this method is actually more prone to representation collapse, uh, where the embedding vectors, again, uh, uh, 
Oh, sorry, sorry. Distillation-based methods, the one that I presented with SimSiam, is more prone to representation collapse, where uh, the embedding vectors project to a trivial solution. Uh, whereas contrastive methods are more prone to dimensionality collapse, where the embedding vectors span a lower dimensional space. Uh, so what can cause this? There's a variety of different reasons, uh, but one really common case is really strong augmentations, right? Uh, so let's think of a use case. Um, let's just say we're in MNIST land again. Uh, good to be here. Uh, so imagine you do a random resize crop of part of a digit, right? You have a seven, you crop out that digit. Um, the second view that you produce, let's just say it's a, z a region of zero pixels. Um, and then you're, you pass both of these views to the model. Uh, it's very hard to satisfy this objective of mapping a digit or to match a digit and just zero pixels, right? So the, the, function, the strength of the augmentations is quite important. Um, it can be mitigated through augmentation multiplicity or multi-crop like Dan had presented earlier, uh, but that's something to pay attention to. And these two papers down here do a really good job and talk about some metrics that you can use to track both representation and dimensionality collapse. So please take a look if you're interested. Um, and finally, obviously, over-parameterization, specifically in small data regimes. So if you have a very small data set and a very large model, uh, the model can learn to essentially memorize the data set even under augmentation. So that's something to be aware of. Great. Uh, so we're going to talk about one more class of model families. But yes, happy to take questions. <laughs> I can repeat it if it's easier as well. Uh, why, why not use a beta VAE as instead of a standard encoder so that, to avoid that kind of like representation collapse? Yeah, that's a great. So you mean like a pre-trained beta VAE essentially, right? Yeah. So the nice thing of VAEs is they have this rate distortion trade-off, uh, and you don't have collapse essentially because you have a Lagrange multiplier on the KL divergence, which uh, smoothens out the space. I don't think anyone's tried that. I think that's an open problem. If you, uh, yeah, we should chat some more. I don't think I have an answer for you, but that sounds like a great idea. We've we've explored some latent variable models uh, with um, with SSL. So we have a paper or a workshop paper called StuffCon, which projects through a Bernoulli distribution. We also have a, a Gaussian reparameterization. Um, the problem is adding a rate. Um, a KL divergence essentially trades off the downstream performance quite substantially in our experience. Um, so if you project through a Bernoulli through a reparameterization like Gumbel Softmax, um, you actually don't have to do the KL divergence and you'll still get Bernoulli or binary outputs. So you get sort of the best of both worlds and it is a form of regularization in a way. But uh, I think the hand wavy answer is regularization is the answer to most problems, but uh, happy to chat some more later as well. So any other questions? Okay, great. So uh, the last category that we're gonna discuss is a class of SSL models that we kind of bucket under this reconstructive SSL paradigm. And um, this is akin to some of the pretext tasks that Miguel was talking about earlier. Uh, and the objective here is you corrupt your input in some manner and essentially try to recover the uncorrupted input. Uh, so examples here are uh, denoising autoencoders, the seminal work by Vincent et al. from 2008, which has been inspiration for some of the new diffusion models like DALI, uh, Imogen, and stable diffusion that you've probably seen everywhere in the media now. Um, we Super resolution as well is another sort of reconstructive SSL algorithm, and it's very simple. You would downsample your image and have the network try to recover the high resolution image. And you can think of this as a pretext task as well. Uh, more recently, there's been masked autoencoders by Kaiming He et al., uh, which essentially masks out patches uh, in an image and essentially tries to regress the patches. Uh, they use vision transformers, and it's very successful. Uh, but the one I want to talk about today is none of these. Um, we're going to talk about BERT, uh, which is used in natural language processing. And BERT can be kind of classified under this reconstructive SSL paradigm as well. So let's dive into that. Um, so BERT typically has uh, two tasks that it has to optimize. Um, one is called mass token prediction. So We've simplified this quite a bit here. Uh, typically, you wouldn't have words here. You'd have tokens, which are embedded uh, in a different uh, 
DSL based on the language that you're working with. So if it's, you might have a tokenizer for images, you might have a tokenizer for language, and all of these are different from each other. But for simplicity, we're just going to keep them as words for now. Um, so the goal with BERT is essentially, the first one is this masked token prediction objective, uh, where we randomly mask out a subset of tokens. Uh, I think the typical default is 30%. Um, and the model essentially has to predict what those missing words were in the training objective. There is also a secondary objective called next sentence prediction, um, where the model tries to predict whether the next sentence that's coming after is, is related or not. So in this case, it's to be or not to. And then is the next sentence that is the? It's yes or no type question. Um, and the reason that this is in place is uh, once you've trained this model, uh, some tasks that you would fine tune BERT on use this CLS token. Uh, and this CLS token is important. It needs to be conditioned in a way that it's useful during training. And this is one proxy way to be able to get that to happen. All right. Um, <clears throat> so fine tuning BERT is relatively inexpensive. Uh, you can download BERT from Hugging Face and fine tune it for your application. People have used BERT for numerous different things. This is just a small subset of what people use it for. Uh, so for example, uh, sentiment analysis and text classification could be done relatively easily by using the CLS token of a pre-trained BERT and either fine tuning your model or adding a linear probe, for example. And there's different performance boundaries based on how you model this problem. There's also question answering and paraphrasing where you would use the SEP token uh, to be able to sort of answer multiple choice questions. And people have thought of many different ways. So this is just a very small subset. Um, we have the link to the hugging face kind of BERT base uncased model here. So you can try it out. It's relatively straightforward. Um, great. So this is the last algorithm that we're going to talk about. Um, and this ties back into what Dan was saying about views. So views don't have to be one modality augmented in different ways. It can be multiple modalities that rep or a sample for multiple modalities that represent the same thing. So image text pairs, for example, right? And that's exactly what Clip was actually trained on. Um, so Clip was trained with a massive corpus of web scale data. So it's just scraped image caption labels. And um, the nice thing about Clip, though, is that it only uses ImageNet augmentations, which is horizontal flip and random resize crop, uh, which is a very simplistic augmentation stack. So there's very little inductive bias about the problem baked in. So we don't have color jitter, which might be useful, say, if you're classifying birds. Uh, we don't have these biases baked in. Uh, so I think that's one of the really strong things about Clip in that it relaxes the augmentation stack a lot. That being said, uh, you are trading off performance uh, for this. So even though Clip was trained with a really large corpus of data, it is outperformed by some of the more complex models, such as Dino and BYOL, that use these complex augmentation stacks. Uh, so it, it matters what augmentations you choose. So if there's something you take away from this talk, that should be it. Um, great. And let's look at some pseudocode for Clip. Uh, it looks very similar to the SimClear pseudocode that Dan was presenting earlier. In fact, it's very similar, uh, but let's step through it anyway. Um, so we have, some in, we have two models, though, here, which is uh, important detail. We'll have an FT, which is the text model, and an FI, which is an image model, along with two uh, projections, HI and HT. Uh, so rather than the one model earlier, we'll have a different model to handle each of the modalities in a more modality-specific manner. Um, we get tuples of image text pairs. Uh, we pass it through our text model. Uh, we pass the image representations to the image model. Um, and then we also pass them through these projections, which Dan explained why we need in terms of the guillotine regularization perspective. Um, and then the similarity is exactly the same. Uh, the only difference here between uh, what Dan presented earlier is that the, the temperature here is a learnable parameter. Although empirically, it doesn't make that big of a difference, uh, but take that with a grain of salt. Uh, and the rest of it is, again, the symmetrized cross-entropy objective, and you just update your model. So are there any questions here or on the previous slides? Can you take them now? Easy. Perfect. 
OK. Um, so what would you use CLIP for? I'm sure you've seen this in the media. Uh, at, like diffusion models are gaining traction because they're generating amazing looking images. Uh, so here in, in DALI, for example, they use CLIP guided diffusion. Um, and here's an example of a text query that I gave DALI, which is multimodal neural representation learning as a Yukio e painting. And it's maybe hard to tell where all the neural networks are here, but I think it's still really cool. Um, so I just had to put this up there. Uh, but it's, it's a general purpose conditioning vector. And one example where it's used is, for example, in these diffusion models. Uh, people have also extended CLIP to uh, work with multiple modalities besides just image text couplings. So for example, self-supervised multimodal versatile networks uses video slash image, because there's a, a way to trivialize that, and audio and text in a triplets type loss objective to be able to work with multiple modes in an SSL type manner, where you have video, audio, text couplings. And it's very similar to what we've been talking about. Uh, to wrap it up then, um, we see SSL models as actually a general purpose way to transfer research. So consider, ah, sorry, I missed a question, please, yeah. Oh, oh sorry. Uh, hi, I, yeah. based on what you just said, as far as the trifecta of the yeah. text, image, and maybe video, do you sure. ever wonder if like there's an ethical concern of deep fakes coming about that could be like really damaging? Yeah, um, I think for representation learning, it's not so much about deepfakes because we're not interested in the generative aspect, right? So CLIP here is used to guide the diffusion process. So in terms of self-supervised representations, we're actually looking to produce a representation vector that we can use for something else. Uh, you can tip, ideally, in an ideal scenario where you have an invariant representation, a lot of the information is lost and it's very hard to reconstruct the original image. Um, so you can think of this as like the output of a ResNet 50, right? Um, you're not producing the image, you're producing a vector, which is what all the models we've really talked about today are working with. So uh, the deep fakes are, well, it's more for generative models, I would say. That's a question for that, but great question. Anyone else? Yes? Um, I seem to have understood that um, you say it is not necessary to augment the text part in the image text pairs. Um, and I wonder, I mean, is the, the reason for that, for that that your text embedding is already quite advanced and probably already has the properties you want, or is there a, because in general, it doesn't seem, doesn't seem, seem logical, right? <laughs> Could yeah. you comment on this, please, thanks. Sure, uh, I think the devil is in the details, like always, um, and you, it's not that you don't need to augment it, it's that it was chosen to not augment it in this particular setting, so the images go under light augmentation, I need to double check exactly what the text augmentations are, but um, it's a little bit trickier to do text augmentations in general. So there's masking, which is a general purpose strategy, uh, which a lot of papers do, like uh, data to vec and a lot of other newer models. But um, otherwise, you could do something like replacing words with BERT. Uh, so there's many different strategies. Uh, so the answer is, it's not bad, it's just not so easy to do text augmentation versus image augmentation, which we have you know, a, a slew of transforms that we're very familiar with. So I hope that answers the question. I have a question too. Yeah. Uh, I was just wondering if your downstream task is uh, different from, uh, from your pre-text task. Yeah. Do these models, like I don't know, you use like some sort of an image um, input data set to learn the representation and you have like an NLP, typical NLP task for the the head part of it, so mm -hmm. the downstream task of it. Do these models still perform well? Right, so so CLIP is a multi, so recall with CLIP here, we have two models. We have the text model and the image model. And the goal of these models is to take the representation of the text and the representation of the image and bring them close together in latent space. So ideally, if you pass in an image, you'll get a representation that is close to the text representation. So you don't need the text representation to get something that you could use for your downstream task and vice versa as well, right? So you could pass in the text representation, get a latent vector that's close to the image representation. And so, so you can actually do both NLP tasks and image tasks with something like Clip. So it's something, it depends a little bit on the views that you're learning. Yeah. Right. In this case, the views are the modes, right? Uh, so it's actually a very general purpose uh, view, I guess, <laughs> right? Thank you. Sure. Okay.
All right. Uh, yeah. So, so what I was trying to say is um, a nice way to think about SSL models is uh, a way to sort of distill information uh, between, you know, uh, between researchers. So we have complex uh, processes that occur in the natural world, uh, like the naive Stokes, Navier Stokes equation, Newton's laws of motion. Uh, but we find summarizations for these complex processes that we are able, able to hand off to other researchers to be able to improve on. Um, in a way, self-supervised learning is like that. We're summarizing complex visual processes, audio processes, any modality essentially that we're working with um, in a very compact form as neural network weights. And handing that off to researchers as a bootstrap for their own research, I think, is a very elegant way to think about self-supervised learning. Um, and it's, it's, it's a general purpose mechanism so far as we've been talking about. It, it produces representation vectors that you can use for downstream tasks. Um, and it depends on how you condition your model, but the devil, again, is in the details. OK, so we've taken a whirlwind tour <laughs> of some of the main SSL algorithms. Uh, we've learned about contrastive approaches with SimClear. Uh, where you pass a single mode through multiple through an augmentation policy to produce multiple modes. Uh, we've looked at distillation-based objectives, which take the same process but remove the need for having negative samples, which might be very challenging in some domains, right? Uh, what is a negative sample in video? Is it two frames ahead, three frames ahead? So it removes that restriction, which is very powerful. Uh, we've also discussed some reconstruction-based techniques, like BERT. Um, and uh, we've briefly looked at how to work with multiple modalities in a uh, SSL approach like Clip. Uh, but there's something important to note that it's not just classification performance uh, that's important. SSL has another huge takeaway. So there's this paper by Goyal et al. Uh, and I highly recommend taking a look. Um, essentially here they train a model called SEER. Um, it's a very large model. Uh, they have a 10 billion parameter SEER model that was trained on billions of samples. Um, and what they showed is that on the left two plots that you're looking at, uh, it's, it's object detection in uh, households with different income brackets where maybe data samples are restricted or there's some other restriction that you might not be able to observe naturally. And in these cases, these models, these self-supervised models, are doing a much better job, for example, for object detection. And on the right-hand side here, um, you see that these models are much fairer in terms of reducing some of the biases that you might see with uh, a supervised model trained in the same scenario. And this happens across the board, which is one of the really powerful things that I want to leave you with here today, because it's not just about having a model that gets the best ImageNet performance. There's a lot of other details that are important, and SSL takes us a step towards that avenue. Um, so there's a lot of open challenges. So uh, if you're interested, there's a lot of cool research happening in SSL. Um, one, again, is to minimize the uh, reliance on augmentation and domain knowledge. And models like masked autoencoders are taking a step towards doing that. Um, there's also the aspect of using less compute to train SSL models. Um, now, that being said, as Dan mentioned, uh, once the SSL model is trained, all the downstream tasks and even the fine-tuning tasks take much less time. So if you amortize the compute across all the tasks that you're looking at, you're, you're doing a better job, essentially. But still, it would be great if we can train these from the scratch without uh, using so much compute. Uh, then there's also stability. So for example, in reinforcement learning, um, there's better compositionality. How can you compose different objects and relate things together in a more meaningful way? Uh, better multimodal SSL representations. Uh, so we looked at CLIP, um, but you can think of uh, a, a good multimodal representation as fully utilizing a mode rather than just leveraging one of the modes, for example. Uh, and this, there are some problems around this space. Happy to talk about it later if you're interested. Um, equivariant rather than invariant representations. Uh, so ideally, you don't want color jitter, for example, because let's say you're doing bird classification, which is my go-to example. Uh, birds, color is important. So losing this information in an invariant type SSL model is bad. So uh, ideally, we would like to get to an equivariant space. And of course, better theoretical underpinnings and interpretable representations would be great. Um, 
Right. Uh, so there's some great resources that we want to leave you with. Um, and these slides are online, so don't need to take pictures or anything. But uh, there's the NYU Deep Learning SSL lecture, the UC Berkeley Deep Learning course, and this awesome NeurIPS 2021 tutorial, which we would highly recommend taking a look at. And here's a small subset of essentially the reading list that we talked about, but all the references are in the slides as well. Happy to take any general questions, and even for Dan or Miguel as well. So.